a pleasure for me, indeed, to uh, introduce uh, Carl uh, Zygmunt. Uh, we know each other for a number of years, and uh, <coughs> I had uh, much uh, appreciation for his work all these years. And uh, it's interesting to note that although uh, somewhat classic, uh, the type of, uh, of dynamics uh, he does, uh, in uh, recent years he became uh, uh, in some sense, again, central, as it used to be uh, uh, some uh, decades before. So it was always important, but now it's central. And so, uh, uh, and he's uh, uh, a central figure in this, in this area. So uh, uh, it's uh, for us uh, uh, very important to have him here. And I hope that uh, this will be just your first uh, cooperation with us. And, uh, I mean in, in terms of your presence. Otherwise, you've been cooperating for, for, for quite a while. So uh, we will have a, a mini course to, to lecture no? uh, on evolutionary game dynamics. Please. Thank you very much, John. I, I don't know. Maybe they want. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's uh, really a wonderful opportunity for me to, to be here and a great pleasure. Um, I think that a certain number of you have already listened to other courses in, on evolutionary games and therefore I plan to start fairly quick in order to arrive to some things that might be new for newer for most of you. Uh, if I'm too quick, uh, please uh, just stop me. Uh, let me first start with a basic notion of classical game theory. This is the notion of a Nash equilibrium, which was introduced uh, more than 50 years ago. Uh, we consider only games between two players and player one and player two and suppose that player one has a certain finite set of strategies one to n player two another set of strategies one to m and that if one player uses i and the other player uses g then their payoffs are given by this a i g and b i g by these elements who form a payoff matrix and now it is uh, easy to consider also the case where the players use mixed strategy, where xi is a probability of using strategy i. And similarly, that player 2 uses a mixed strategy y, where yg is a probability of using the strategy j. And then the payoff for the first player would be given by this quadratic expression, and the second for the second player by this other expression. So this is quite obvious and one introduces then the notion of a best reply if player one knows what player two is using and knows that player two is using strategy y then he can find a strategy a best reply to this a strategy x which gives him the highest possible payoff any deviation from this strategy x would lead to a payoff that is not higher maybe lower than this payoff. And similarly, of course, the second player can look for a best reply to the first player. And what Nash showed in his very first paper, when he was 19 or 20 years old, using very simple methods from our Brouwer fixed point theorem, essentially, is that there always exists a Nash equilibrium, that is, a pair of strategies such that each is a best reply to the other. So if two players are using these strategies, then none of the players has any reason to deviate unilaterally from this strategy. So in a sense, this is a consistent solution of the game. However, the problem is that very frequently, there are not just one, but many Nash equilibria. And there is a 
In classical game theory, there is a huge amount of work devoted to the problem which equilibrium to select. Is there in any sense a unique, best, rational solution to the game and so on. And this has led to a huge uh, development uh, of this classical game theory. And about halfway through this development, I think uh, classical game theory is usually supposed to have started in 1944 with the book, first edition of the book by John von Neumann and Oskar Morgenstern. And uh, in 1974, about, uh, another viewpoint was introduced into game theory, a more dynamical viewpoint, and a viewpoint which did not assume that the players were rational in any sense. And this viewpoint came from evolutionary biology. Uh, I may start here with a quote by the famous uh, biologist Ernst Meyer, who said that the greatest conceptual revolution in biology is a replacement of typological thinking by population thinking. Don't ask me what typological thinking <laughs> is exactly, but population thinking, I think I know what this means. One considers populations interacting, and exactly this population thinking was transferred from evolutionary biology to game theory by a population biologist, namely by John Maynard Smith, who introduced this in 1974. Yes, and this has had a huge success, uh, first of all in animal behavior theory, and then in applications to virology, immunology, uh, ecology, and so on, and so on. And uh, I want to speak only on the formal mathematical aspects, essentially. And here it is the simplest, if one considers this population setting, and assumes that the players are interchangeable individuals in a single population. And if we assume that the players are interchangeable, then we introduce a certain notion of symmetry. So we are considering symmet symmetric games in the following sense. If player one is using strategy I and player two is using strategy J, then the payoff for player one is given by this expression is exactly the same as the other player would have had if this other, as the other player would have had if he had played i and the other player would have played g. So the assumption here is that uh, the payoff matrix of one player is given by the transpose of the payoff for the second player. And since players beforehand do not know whether they are in the role one or in the role two then it makes sense to consider only symmetric pairs because they cannot, the players cannot distinguish between each other. And in particular, to look for symmetric Nash equilibrium. Uh, mixed strategy X is said to be a symmetric Nash equilibrium is X is a best reply now against itself because its own strategy is also played, should, would also be played by the other player. So this means that X is a Nash equilibrium, a symmetric Nash equilibrium, if any deviation from X to some other strategy Z would not, be, it would not imply an increase in payoff. The payoff cannot become larger than this expression here. So any unilateral deviation would not lead to any uh, improvement uh, in payoff. Um, the chicken game is well known to most of those at least who have been in the uh, lectures by Fabio and uh, by George certainly and so. Uh, two players are uh, racing against, against each other by, with cars and uh, daring each other to uh, drive straight on and the question is whether to swerve or not to swerve. And then suppose that uh, uh, I escalate, meaning I drive straight on, and the other player swerves, then this would mean that the other player gives $100 to me. If I swerve and the other player escalates, drives straight ahead, then I would have to pay him $100. But if we both swerve, then no one would have to pay something to the other player. But if we both escalate and crash, then we would have to have a lot of 
of to pay in uh, uh, doctor's bill and mechanics bill and so on. So in this case, it is easy to see that if the co-player escalates, I should swerve, and if the co-player swerves, I should escalate. And it is easy to compute uh, the symmetric Nash equilibrium, which would be to swerve with a certain probability of exactly 90% in this case. So this is very easy to, uh, to compute, but it is difficult to explain how in this context where two players are playing against each other, this solution would be stable in any sense. Because suppose that one of the players was deviating by just a little amount from this here, was swerving, suppose, with a larger probability, with 91% probability, then the best reply for the other player would be to swerve not at all. So if the probability of swerving for one player would increase, then the probability for swerving for the, the best probability for swerving for the other player would decrease to zero, and then the first player should not swerve with 90%, but he should swerve with 100%. He should swerve with certainty. So the slightest deviation by one player would lead the two players of, uh, to, to go all the way to extreme opposite strategies. So in this sense, this 90% um, solution is not a stable solution in a game between two players. But if one considers not just two players, but a large population of players engaged in this stupid game. Well, this game is very stupid if one races with cars against each other, but it, it is something that captures the essence of every contest where one can escalate the contest uh, and become violent maybe, or where one can run away if the other one escalates the conflict. If one assumes that this game is played in a large population, and uh, then one, uh, and that uh, xi, that, that, that's a uh, different strategies correspond to different types in the population, and that xi is a frequency of a certain type or a strategy in the population. It is no longer the probability of this strategy, but the frequency of this strategy. Then the state of the population would be given by this uh, vector, which is on the unit simplex, because these frequencies have to sum up to one. So average payoff would be computed in this simple way, and the mean payoff, one could compute uh, again, the mean payoff in the population is given by this quadratic expression. And now, one assumes, following Maynard Smith and others, simply that the, the per capita rate of growth for the frequency of a strategy is given by its success, or more precisely, by the difference between its success, this would be the success of the strategy, the payoff for this strategy, and the average success, the average payoff in the population. So if this difference is positive, this means that the frequency of that strategy would increase. More and more players would adopt this strategy. If it was negative, then fewer and fewer players would adopt this strategy. So this is a simple uh, equation, uh, ordinary differential equation. Uh, so one studies it on the unit simplex Sn. It's easy to see that this unit simplex is invariant. If you start on the unit simplex, you remain on the unit simplex. It's also easy to see that the boundary phases of the simplex are invariant if you start on a boundary phase where one or several of the strategies are absent, thank you, then one remains in this boundary phase. You see, if xi is equal to zero, then it would not increase. This type of dynamics would not introduce a missing strategy into the population. Some simple uh, but useful properties of this replicator equation would be, first of all, that if one adds constant to the columns, this equation would not change at all what you add here would be subtracted here. And another simple and useful property would be the quotient rule that uh, if you consider the quotient between the frequency for strategy I and the frequency for strategy G, then the rate of change of this quotient would be given by the difference between the two payoffs. And now if one uses this, for instance, for, ah yes, before coming to the chicken game, let me just uh, mention how is this, how does this relate 
with the notion of a Nash equilibrium, well, let us first of all look what are the rest points, what are the fixed points of this equation in the simplex. Well, these are the points where xi dot is equal to zero, and since this on the right-hand side is given by a product, this means either that xi is zero or that this difference is zero. And if one looks at, for instance, uh, if one looks whether there is a rest point in the interior of this simplex, away from the boundary, in the interior of this simplex, all this xi would be larger than zero, Hence, necessarily, all these AXI would have the same value, and this would exactly, uh, I mean, uh, this would lead to a system of linear equations which has one or, in, which has generically either one or no solution at all in the interior of the simplex. And uh, this, such an interior solution, would correspond to a Nash equilibrium. More Exactly, a point Z on this simplex is a Nash equilibrium if and only if it is a rest point of the dynamics which satisfies a certain property which has been called a saturated property. And this is a property which plays also a big role in population ecology. Saturated means that if one of the types is missing, if ZI is equal to zero, suppose that this is corner I, and zi equals zero would mean that this strategy is missing, hence that you are on this simplex here. Then, this is uh, uh, the property of being saturated, then the um, payoff for this missing strategy would not be larger than the average payoff in this, in this population. So that if by some stochastic uh, process, for instance, a random shock or so, a small amount of this missing strategy would be introduced, then this missing strategy would not grow because the, the, its payoff would not be larger than the average payoff in the population. This is actually um, an eigenvalue equation. It means that transversally to this boundary phase, the eigenvalue is not strictly positive. So dynamics does not go away from this boundary point uh, in the direction of the missing strategy. What one can show, and this has been called the folk theorem of evolutionary game theory because one cannot attribute it to any particular person. Uh, what one can show is that these four uh, statements hold um, first of all is that every Nash equilibrium is a rest point. It is even more, it is a saturated rest point. The second is that a strict Nash equilibrium, a strict Nash equilibrium is an equilibrium where if you deviate, um, if you deviate from Z, if you deviate from Z to some other X, then this other strategy would have strictly lower payoff than the strategy you deviate from. A strict Nash equilibrium would be an attractor, meaning uh, locally asympto uh, asymptotically stable fixed point. So stable rest points, stable in the sense of Lyapunov, would be all Nash equilibria. And if you have a Nash equilibrium on the boundary, maybe, or on the interior, if it's on the boundary and if it is a limit of an orbit from the interior, then this would be a Nash equilibrium. All these uh, statements can be shown in a few lines, and uh, none of them, incidentally, for none of them, the converse holds, incidentally. So uh, one can, by using this uh, characterization of Nash equilibria, a saturated rest point of the, of the replicator equation, one can get a very simple uh, proof of uh, the theorem that there always exists a Nash equilibrium. Consider this replicator dynamics and perturb it a little bit by adding some small positive term epsilon. This would correspond to a steady immigration of this mixed 
strategy of this of this uh, strategy i at this little thing so in that case in order to remain on the simplex one would have to correct this and this is why i left a little place here empty one has to correct this by uh, introducing also this minus n epsilon in this in this term here so all that happens here is that one has introduced in, in into the to the replicator equation, one has perturbed it in such a way that on the boundary of the simplex, which for the replicator equation is an invariant set, on the boundary the flow now points inward. And now, of course, if you have such a flow pointing inward, then there must be a fixed point for this, for this vector field. There must be a fixed point somewhere in there. And now one lets epsilon go to zero, well, the fixed point, incidentally, has to, uh, it's a fixed point, the left-hand side is zero, and hence the right-hand side must be zero. Hence, the fixed point must satisfy this simple property here. And, and now one lets epsilon go to zero and see what happens. What happens with uh, that there must be accumulation points of this z of epsilon, and what would the accumulation points be? Well, on the, if you let uh, epsilon go to zero, then this expression in the bracket, well, if zi of epsilon goes to zero, meaning that if this point in the interior is moving towards the boundary, then 1 over zi becomes very large, and this will be a negative expression. This goes to minus infinity. It is multiplied by epsilon, which can go to zero, but it is a positive expression. So on the right-hand side, you get something that is less or equal than zero. So in the, for the accumulation point, you see you get something which is a saturated rest point, sorry, which is a saturated rest point because it's an accumulation point where the epsilon is equal to zero. One gets that this difference is less or equal than zero. So this is saturated fixed point means uh, a Nash equilibrium, and this is a very simple way, a dynamical way to prove the existence of a Nash equilibrium. I have stressed that uh, it is not very hard. There are many other proofs of the existence of Nash equilibrium. It's not a very hard proof. But what I like about this proof is that it is so uh, biologically, so intuitive. You add to this replicator dynamics, you simply add a migration term, and then you make the migration term weaker and weaker, and what comes out is a proof of this replicator dynamics, of this um, existence of the Nash equilibrium. If one has only two strategies in the population, for instance, in the chicken game, where there are just to escalate or not to escalate, to swerve, then uh, one can, uh, uh, this is described by a two by two matrix. And as I have mentioned, one can to each column add some constant. So one can add a constant such that you have zero in the diagonal. So this is no restriction of generality of assuming that the two by two matrix has zero in the diagonal, and then the replicator dynamic is given by this expression here, x dot is equal to x times one minus x times this linear expression, and one sees immediately that uh, the rest point x equals zero, x equals one, and if this is in the interior, this x is equal to a divided by a plus b would be rest points of this uh, dynamics. And therefore, if one has only two strategies to consider, then uh, so, so dynamics is extremely simple. There are only, generically, there are only three possible outcomes. One would be dominance. One strategy goes to, one frequency goes to zero, and the other frequency goes to one. The other thing would be a bi-stability. Depending on the, on the initial condition, one goes either to this uh, uh, corner, or to this corner of this one-dimensional simplex. And the third, probably, uh, the third possible case would be the stable coexistence. If you start anywhere in the interior of this segment, you converge toward this uh, fixed point in the interior, which corresponds to a Nash equilibrium. And if you have uh, heard these uh, tutorials given by Fabio, for instance, you will know that uh, there are very simple but important examples for each of these three uh, dynamics, for instance, for the prisoner's dilemma game, 
which can be given by this uh, matrix and the prisoner's dilemma game you have heard a lot already. Uh, X would go to zero. No matter what the initial condition is, the frequency of cooperators would decline to zero. Uh, if you have the repeated prisoner's dilemma, if you assume that the prisoner's dilemma is repeated, say, uh, I've forgotten how often, say six times on average, then one would get this payoff matrix for if you consider as the two strategies tit for tat on one hand and always defect on the other hand. This would be the prisoner's dilemma payoff matrix. Equivalently, it would be of this type. And there, you would have a bi-stability, meaning that depending on the initial condition, you end up with a population either consisting of tit for tat or of always defect. And finally, if you consider the chicken game, or as uh, uh, Christoph Howard has mentioned, the snowdrift game, where the payoff is, for instance, of this form here. Then you would have uh, uh, a stable equilibrium. You would have this convergence to this interior equilibrium, where one-tenth of the population would escalate the conflict, and 90% would not escalate, but rather swerve away from the conflict. And in this case, you see that in this population setup, this now is stable. This is an equilibrium which is stable. If you start close by, if you, if you are not exactly in this equilibrium, but close by, then the replicator dynamics would drive you, the population dynamics would drive you towards this equilibrium. So in this sense, this is a much stabler interpretation of the notion of uh, symmetric Nash equilibrium for the chicken game uh, than if you consider only two players facing each other. So as I mentioned, if one has two strategies, there is absolutely no problem at all. For three strategies, uh, there are already more possibilities. Uh, there are, uh, roughly speaking, 100 different phase portraits, 103, I think, or so I've forgotten. It's already more interesting situations can happen, and the main reason why these situations are with n equals 3 is more interesting is that there is possibility for a rock, scissors, paper type of cycle. You will all know the rock, scissors, paper uh, game. There are three strategies. Rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and paper beats rock. They are in this kind of cyclic uh, ordering. And uh, the question is now, how can one analyze this rock, scissors, paper game? Um, as I have mentioned, one can always, by adding constants to columns, without restricting generality, assume that there are zeros in the diagonal. So without restriction of generality, one gets a matrix which is of this type, where the A's and the B's are all positive expression. Consider, for instance, uh, the situation where only strategy one and strategy two would be present in the population. So this game would be described by this two by two matrix. And here one sees that no matter what the other player is doing, it is better to use the second strategy. So uh, the second strategy, scissors, would be better than the first strategy, rock. Scissors beats rock. I think, no, it's just the opposite. But uh, similarly, if one considers the second and the third strategy, then this would be described by this two by two matrix. Then one sees immediately that the second strategy is beaten by the third strategy. No matter what the composition in the population, no matter what the initial frequency of the second and the third strategy, in the end, there will only be the third strategy around. And similarly, the third strategy will be dominated or beaten by the first strategy. What one can immediately check is that this fixed point here, these corner points of the simplex, well, they are rest points, first of all, and they are saddle points. There is, in one direction, the flow points inward, and in the other direction, the flow points outward. So eigenvalues actually, for instance, at, yes, at this first at corner E1, so eigenvalues would be B1 and minus A1. So these are saddle points. 
And on the boundary, there are only these three rest points. And they are saddle points. Uh, there are no points, uh, no, no rest points uh, in the middle of an edge or so. There are only these corner points. And these corner points are not saturated because if you, if you sit, for instance, in this corner and introduce a little amount of this missing strategy, say this is corner one, if you introduce a little amount of this missing strategy two, then what happens will be that two will take over. So this is not a saturated fixed point. A small minority of the missing strategy can invade and take over. And so this are, these corner points are not Nash equilibria, but there must be somewhere a Nash equilibrium, and hence there must be a Nash equilibrium in the interior. And the question is, what happens now? Is this Nash equilibrium in the interior, is it an attractor, as I have drawn here, or is it a repeller, or what is it? And um, yes, this is what I have mentioned. There, is a, there must be a unique Nash equilibrium in the interior. And what is the dynamic behavior? This unique Nash equilibrium in the interior must be a solution in, the, in this Nash equilibrium, since it is an equilibrium. The first strategy must do as good as a second strategy, and it must do as good as a third strategy. So the payoffs for the three strategies in this equilibrium set must be all equally equal. And the common value is, of course, the average payoff in this, in this um, in this state of the population. Um, there is a nice theorem which was originally proved by uh, Christopher Siemen a long time ago and whose proof has been very neatly arranged by Joseph Hofbauer, who is around, which says that in this situation for the Roxisos paper game, the following four conditions are equivalent. First, that Z is locally stable, that is an attractor. If you start close by, you converge there. Second, that Z is even globally stable. If you start anywhere in the interior of the simplex, with all three strategies present, then you will end up in this equilibrium. The third strategy is a simple uh, condition uh, on the sign of the determinant of this payoff matrix, and the, third, uh, and the last condition says that the average payoff in this population must be larger than zero. So these four conditions are equivalent, and if they do not hold, more precisely, if the determinant of A is less than zero, if it is equal to zero, incidentally, then the situation is quite easy. Uh, one has a fixed point which is surrounded by periodic orbits. But if the determinant of A is less than zero, then the orbits, as I've drawn them here, flow away from, from, the, of this, from this equilibrium, and they flow closer and closer to the boundary. And they form there a heteroclinic cycle, which is dynamically a quite interesting, actually fascinating, um, object which a uh, long time in classical dynamical system has been neglected because it was not structurally stable. But in this context with these uh, games, it is a structurally stable phenomenon. What happens here is that you come close to this fixed point, you will be almost fixed, meaning stay there for a long time, linger around, then suddenly move over there, stay close to this equilibrium for a much, much longer time, then switch over there in a relatively fast time, stay still much closer for still longer time, and so on, and so on, endlessly. So an approach, uh, not a single point, but one approaches an invariant set consisting of these three saddle points and the corresponding saddle connections. And how to prove this? I want only to sketch this proof. As I have mentioned, this Nash equilibrium must satisfy that each of the conditions, each of the strategies gives the same payoff. Now the strategies are given by this linear, the payoffs are given by these linear expressions, and therefore one can very easily compute the, uh, the, the coordinates of Z. So of this type, so of this type. Uh, the first coordinate would be B2, B3 plus B2, A3 plus A2, A3. And then one cyclically permutes the coordinate to get the second and the third expression. And then one has to multiply the whole thing by some positive constant in order to guarantee that this expression is in the simplex, meaning that the uh, 
that uh, the three coordinates z1 plus z2 plus z3 sum up to 1. What one can show immediately is uh, that uh, sigma is a positive expression, as I said, that uh, the determinant of A has the same sign as the average payoff at this point. Now, what one does is to construct a Lyapunov function, which is a function uh, defined on the simplex and given by this power product. So zi are the numbers which uh, correspond to the coordinates of the Nash equilibrium. And one considers now, on this simplex, what happens if you start at a certain point and then move along following the orbit issued from this point. So as you move along, the value of p, of this function p, at this point is uh, changes. It is like uh, you, you have a path. Imagine that this is a triangular island, uh, that on this island uh, the, the sea level is given by p of x. This is how high you are above the sea. If you are on the boundary where some of the coordinates are zero, you are at sea level. And in the interior, you have a, a summit of this landscape, and the summit is exactly at this point z, as is well known. And what happens if you follow this orbit is, as I will show, uh, uh, that uh, you always walk uphill. And therefore, if you always walk uphill, you will be sure in the end, uh, you always walk uphill if the determinant of A is larger than zero. And if you do this, you will be sure in the end of uh, moving towards the summit. So indeed, uh, p dot can easily be computed to be given by this expression. And if you introduce xi, which is a difference between x and z, and please uh, like to notice that since x and z are on the unit simplex, the sum of the coordinates of xi would be equal to zero. If one introduces this, one gets for p dot, this is equal to minus p times this expression here. Uh, to this expression, one can add zero. And this is just another way of adding zero. Because az, the, the three coordinates of az, are all of the same order. And the sum of xi, uh, the coordinates of xi is zero. Therefore, this here will be zero. And therefore, one can write this expression in the parentheses in the following way. It is just given by this inner product of xi times a times xi. And if one multiplies this, one finds uh, the following expression. And so the clever trick now of uh, Hofbauer is to say that there is actually no restriction of generality to assume that the differences here of these payoff values are all equal. This can always be obtained by making a projective change in coordinates within this simplex. And if one has this, then uh, this, this common value C of the differences can be taken in front of the whole expression. And what remains is this simple algebraic expression. And uh, one, one ends up by finding that this is equal to this common value C which is incidentally equal to the determinant of A, uh, of the same sign as the determinant of A, times P times this square. And uh, if, if the determinant of A is larger than 0, this means that C is larger than 0, P, this product, is also larger than 0, and this sum of squares is also always larger than 0. This means that P is always positive. You always walk uphill, and you have to end up in the summit. And if C is negative, then you walk downhill, and you have to end up at sea level on the border of this simplex. I have mentioned already once last week that this rock scissors paper game was considered for a long time by biologists to be a sheer mathematical artificiality. But it can occur in nature, and in particular, it can occur for a type of lizards, Uta stansburiana, which where the males have, are three different, are of three different types. Three different types are inheritable from father to son, the same characteristics. 
And one type would be to be monogamous and to guard the female jealously. The second type, which is better and uh, can supersede this first type, would be to be polygamous, to have several females, and therefore to have several, uh, uh, much more opportunities for producing offspring. But of course, if you have several females, you cannot watch them all the time. And therefore, if the population is mostly polygamous, then lose males who do not stay with a family, but just wander around and attempt sneaky matings, will be able to take over and to invade the population. And what happens in this rock scissors paper game, which was um, uh, studied very closely and uh, all the parameters were measured, is that this rock scissors paper game is of the type where the replicator dynamics would lead to a mixed population with all three types around. And there exists another rock scissors paper game in nature, which was found uh, just uh, two years ago, I think, or so, among bacteria, E. coli bacteria, actually, which can, a mutant of this bacteria can produce a certain toxic, which poisons the neighbors, the other bacteria around. But uh, it must, of course, not poison the producer of this toxic, and therefore the producer of this toxic, this mutant bacteria, must also possess an immunity protein. This type, this mutant, will take over a normal population, but then after some time there is a new mutant which no longer produces the toxic strain, but only the immunity. So producing the toxic uh, uh, colicine is, makes no sense any longer because all others have the immunity anyway. Therefore, it is better rather than pr to produce this to invest all these resources in producing offspring. And therefore, this second type will outcompete this first mutant. And if this second type outcompetes the first one, this means that after some time, there will be only those who produce the immunity protein, but not the poison. In this case, why have the immunity protein? So there will be a new type, namely the original type that can invade. The original type that produces neither the poison nor the immunity protein can invade, and it turns out that these three types are again in a rock scissors paper type uh, competition, and this time, neatly enough, they are, in a, they are converging towards a boundary. So this would be a rock scissors paper time game with, uh, which should converge to a heteroclinic cycle. Uh, I have said that for n equals 3, one can get a full classification of all 100 different phase portraits. For n equals 4 and larger, there is no classification, no uh, full classification yet, in spite of heroic efforts, in particular by Christopher Zeman, for instance, and so there have been a lot of work has been invested in this, but the situation becomes extraordinarily complicated. This is, it is just as complicated, in fact, it is equivalent to the problem of classifying Lotka Volterra equations, which are the most important equations in mathematical ecology. Um, and there, if the dimension is large enough, uh, there can be one or there can be several limit cycles. There can be chaotic attractors. All hell breaks loose. So this is a wonderful playground for mathematicians who want to study uh, most interesting dynamical phenomenon. So far, I have assumed, as the early uh, uh, evolutionary game theories like John Maynard Smith and others have assumed, that the dynamics proceeds uh, by inheritance, that good strategies spread because they yield many offspring, and offspring would inherit these good strategies, which incidentally assumes clonal replication, which is not actually the case for higher organisms like us, for instance. But it is important to stress that there are other derivations of, repl of replicator dynamics which are more, uh, which make more sense, for instance, for human populations, because they are based on learning or on imitation mechanisms. And what I want to say, oh, yeah, this, the time surely flies. What I want to say towards the end of this lecture is that. Um, this replicator equation is just one, this may be the standard, but just one type of evolutionary game dynamics. There are many, many other types of evolutionary game dynamics 
Most of them are less well studied than the replicator dynamics, and they offer a lot, a playground of many interesting, uh, for many interesting problems. So let me start, for instance, with mentioning imitation dynamics, where one assumes that occasionally a player, say a human player now, updates his strategy by switching with a certain probability to the strategy of another player, by adopting the strategy of this other player with a certain probability, with a certain rate, f i g, he would switch from having the strategy g to adopting strategy i. So equation then would be of this type here. This would be a simple input-output dynamics which would lead this ordinary differential equation. Now it makes sense to assume that this rate of switching depends essentially on comparing the payoffs between this other player and my payoff, my own payoff. For instance, the most easy uh, assumption would be that if the other player has a lower payoff, I stick with my own strategy. But if the other player has a higher payoff, then I will certainly adopt this strategy. If we assume this, we get the so-called imitates the better dynamics. In that, for this imitates the better dynamics, the frequency of a strategy would increase if and only if its payoff is better, not at the average in the population, this would be the replicator equation, but is better than the median in the population. What one can show is that in that case, uh, this imitates a better dynamics leads to um, a, a piecewise dynamics, actually. For instance, for the uh, rock, scissors, paper game, there would be six different regions. This would be one, this the other, this the third, fourth, five, six, six different regions, depending on the rank ordering of the three payoff values. And depending in which region you are, you are in a different, you are following a different dynamics, but this dynamics is given by a certain type of replicator equation. So what, what, is, what you obtain here is a dynamics which corresponds to gluing together six different types, actually only three because two of them are very similar, several different types of replicator dynamics. And for instance, for the rock, scissors, paper game, this can yield a, a heteroclinic cycle of, of, this, of the way I have described it here. Um, if one assumes that um, f is an increasing function of the difference between the two payoff values, or more precisely of the positive part of the difference between the two payoff values, because certainly players are not going to adopt a strategy which does less well. But if they encounter a strategy that does better, they may not adopt it with 100% probability, but only with a certain probability, which depends on how much better this other strategy is. If we assume this, we arrive to an equation which looks very much like the replicator dynamics. In fact, if f is a linear function, one gets exactly the replicator dynamics. And for several other assumptions on this transmission mechanism, for several other assumptions on how on the rates with which one switches from one strategy to the other, on comes to the replicator dynamics. So the replicator dynamics occurs not only if one assumes replication, clonal replication, but it occurs also if one assumes certain uh, mechanisms of imitating more successful players. I want to switch this uh, over and go in the last part of this um, first part of the mini course on a third type of dynamics which is called the best reply dynamics. This is the following. One assumes that there is a large population. And from time to time, a player says, what am I doing exactly? 
shouldn't I, am I doing the right thing? Or should I switch to another strategy? And we assume that the player can estimate the state of the population. So he has a good guess about how many players are using this, how many players are using that strategy. He understands the state of the population, and he's rational enough to figure out what the best answer, the best strategy would be given that this population is in this state. So in most cases, most reasonable cases, there is a single best reply given a certain state. And we assume now that the player with a certain probability would adopt this best reply. So there is a small amount in the population, a small amount at every moment, switching over to this best reply. More and more players are playing this best reply. Therefore, the, the composition of the population, the X, is going to change. And what can happen is that after a certain time, suddenly, another strategy is best reply. So uh, here I wrote down the best reply dynamics. It just captures the fact that uh, if you are in state X, say, and if beta of X would be, say, this strategy, then more and more players would use this strategy, and therefore there would be fewer and fewer there. The state of the population would go actually along a straight line toward this best strategy. But then it could happen that suddenly some other strategy is the best. And then the, there would be a switch, and more and more players would be using this other strategy. One can figure this out, for instance, in the rock scissors. Well, uh, first of all, in this game, for instance, a game given by this uh, payoff matrix. If one starts, for instance, in this lower triangle here, the best reply there would be to use this strategy. And so more and more players would use this strategy, and the orbits point straight on in this direction. Similarly, for starting from here, the orbits would point toward this fixed point, and conversely, in this third triangle. And once you hit this boundary, then actually there are two best strategies, namely this one and this one, and actually every, every convex combination of this. There would be two best strategies. So one must say, what is the best strategy now? Actually, this, I've written it as a differential inclusion, as you may notice, because beta of x is not necessarily as a singleton. It can happen occasionally that this is a set. But there is a theory of differential inclusions. And in this case, it says that you follow along this line, and uh, you go closer and closer in this direction, and you will end up finally in this rest point here in the interior. And it's particularly interesting for the best reply dynamics. Only embarrassingly, I have, uh, when I prepared this, uh, I have switched one and two. Yes? So for instance, in this region here, two, not one, two would be the best strategy. And you would move in a straight direction towards two. Until you hit this boundary, and then you come into a region where three is the best strategy. So the population would move along a straight line, closer and closer in this direction, until it hits this boundary. And now one, I apologize for this, is, this two should be one. One would be go in this direction, and so on and so on. So one has a piecewise linear orbits. And the question is whether these piecewise linear orbits converge to this Nash equilibrium or not. And it turns out that they converge to this Nash equilibrium if and only if the determinant of A is larger than zero. So I'm finished in a, in a, in a minute. So one situation is that the, that the orbit goes in this kind of spider net. It comes closer and closer to this fixed point. How, does one, how can one show this? There exists, again, a kind of a, um, there exi I'm finished in two minutes. There exists, again, a kind of a Lyapunov function. This time, one uses as a Lyapunov function v of x, which is given by the maximum of the three payoffs. One has ax1, ax2, and ax3. This would be the maximum over i. 
uh, each such payoff is given by a linear expression. And one can show that actually For instance, AX1 would be 0 at 0 at the point 1. It would have a positive value at uh, the corner 2 and a negative value at the corner 3. And the, um, uh, the value would decrease if you go towards the interior of the simplex. So each of these linear payoffs becomes smaller if you go in the interior of the simplex one can assume that this V of X describes something like a crater. Yes? The crater has uh, the minimum is exactly at this value Z, which corresponds to the Nash equilibrium, and there is a crater which goes down there. And what one can show very simple is that if I, for instance, is the best reply, then V dot is given, that's very easy to compute by this expression, which um, it turns out that V dot is equal to minus V of X. So um, if the value, if the minimal value Z is positive, then this means that V of X is always positive. The crater is above sea level. And since uh, V dot is then negative, this means that you would walk down the crater and converge to this fixed point here. But if the minimal value Z transposed AZ is negative, this means that the crater is, the minimal value is below sea level. You could f imagine that the crater is filled by a lake. And if you are above the lake, you go down along the orbits. But if you are below sea level, you would go up. And so the orbits starting from the interior, in that case, would um, converge outward. The orbits it, they would converge towards such a triangle. This is called a Shapley triangle. So in this case, if the determinant of A is, sorry, should be less than zero, then the orbits do not converge to this fixed point here, but the orbits converge to a closed orbit a periodic orbit, which looks like a triangle. From the outside, you converge toward this triangle. From the inside, you converge toward this triangle. This triangle is a Shapley triangle. And the amusing thing that has been found by Josef Hofbauer is that in the replicator dynamics, you have, of course, a completely different, um, you have a di completely different uh, dynamics. Because uh, in that case, the orbit would converge outward towards the boundary, towards this heteroclinic cycle. But if you consider the time average of the different values of the strategies, if you consider the time average of these uh, expressions, then these time averages will converge to this Shapley triangle, to the same Shapley triangle. This is actually something that also a long time ago, and long before there was a best reply dynamics around, had been shown by Christopher Zeman in this context. So excuse me for taking a bit too much time. No, no, so, fine. Uh, I want to stop just by stressing that uh, aside from these dynamics, there are quite a few other ones. You will see some of them in the second part of the mini course. And many of them are not very well understood yet. So there is, I think, a large set of problems for mathematicians around. Thank you. provocative, certainly, yes. a lot of uh, things to do there. Uh, do you uh, plan to uh, write up uh, some of your lecture for us? Or well, uh, this open question? Um, uh, you, you see, uh, a lot of this uh, has already been, uh, is already in this book by Josef Hofbauer That's and myself. Right on evolutionary games and population dynamics. Uh -huh. And there was, uh, I should mention this, there was uh, last year a very large survey article by Joseph uh, Hofbauer and myself yes, in the Wilton uh, 
AMS. So AMS. this does not have the proofs, of course. Yeah. But uh, it, the main point of this article was to stress the multiplicity of uh, dynamics yeah. for these games. Uh, um, when this is supposed to appear? Yeah. Uh, this is, has appeared last that summer. Happened. Yes. Uh, very good. So that you put it uh, to the center of, uh, of dynamics is that article, this whole subject again. No? <laughs> very good. So these are uh, uh, up to date uh, reference that uh, Professor Zygmunt just mentioned. Uh, I hope you all got it, uh, the AMS uh, bulletin, no? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Last year. Uh, any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, first, uh, uh, it's very interesting, this model, because when you begin to spoke about the reply and answer, I thought in chat we have the beginning of the game case, there's a good mm -hmm. scale. Now we have developed the chess theory nowadays you have a lot of openings and a lot of variants very known and a lot of people play that the variant because okay everybody how to, to be with to use mm -hmm. the variant or something like that I think that it's possible a great uh, uh, can I say a great, a great experience in chess to, to study more big reply than answer something like mm -hmm. that and if, uh, some more commentary then on questions. And the second is a really question. In the chicken game, it's possible to put, of course, I'm, I work in engineering, so I'm, I'm interested in for the main problem in engineering is caused by human weak heroes. It's difficult to, to think what the human we can do in the next time. So it's possible a cheeky game, a cheeky game plus um, stochastic theorem from hero people. Okay, uh, in the um, okay, but I thought no, I do that or something like that. It's possible to include that the theory with a game plus a stochastic uh, term. Mm. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, first, uh, your second question. Uh, of course, uh, one can uh, add uh, stochastics, uh, and uh, there is a lot, actually, which has been done mostly by classical game theorists. For instance, about stochastic payoffs. For instance, about uh, stochastic moves. So one this is another thing. Either the payoffs are stochastic, or else the move. You want to, to do one thing, but your hand is trembling or so, and you are doing something else. So there is a large uh, set of possibilities for randomness to enter game theory. Uh, another way is, for instance, to consider these finite populations that Martin has talked about uh, last week or so. There, there are many different approaches on this. And here, uh, for introductory parts, of course, I have left this out completely. Uh, as for your first question, indeed, uh, I think that uh, chess and, and poker and so, they were at the origin of game theory. So were, game theory was not meant to help to play, to be better at chess, I think, but, uh, or to be, become a better poker player. But it was meant as a way of describing how people are figuring out and reacting, plotting their strategies, reacting and anticipating what the others are doing. And this led uh, most of classical game theory, at least in the early stages, was assuming that the players were rational uh, and knew that the other player was rational. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the very simplest experiments in humans show that players are not rational. And e even just by looking at chess, you see that players are not rational, because otherwise they would have hit on, on the optimal strategy, of course. And uh, so one of the good things, unintended uh, good consequences of evolutionary game theory was that one threw the rationality assumption overboard because it makes no sense to assume that lizards or bacteria are rational. And with this new uh, approach where you have more trial and error uh, approach uh, where some strategies succeed and other strategies don't, and uh, that's all you assume, uh, this is 
also a much better instrument for coming back to economic problems, for approaching uh, human uh, game theory again. Because uh, th there are, is now a very flourishing field of economic games. And there, of course, uh, one does not even test whether humans are rational because this is obvious. This is the first uh, assumption. It is something that uh, hits you immediately in the face. So the question is only how do they learn from each other? What are the, the mechanisms that uh, yeah, make them decide this or that? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned this uh, sort of a hundred, a hundred of these different types. There are three strategies. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I found, and I gave to the students, uh, old reference by Siemens. Yes. Which was a conjecture, was mentioned only 19. So yes. There were more than uh, the No, uh, essentially, no, no, uh, Siemens knew this all. But uh, he considered only robust face portraits, which means uh, structurally stable in, in a in an obvious sense. And uh, this number of 100 or so considers also the degenerate cases, where, for instance, the, a whole uh, edge consists only of fixed points, situations like this. So Christopher Siemens did not consider these degenerate cases, but only robust face portraits. And there you get a considerably smaller number, of course. time delays in the reaction of the players. So they will have ODEs with uh, time lags. Uh, right now, I cannot tell you offhand. I mean, uh, there is uh, the same thing that can be done uh, in, with ordinary differential equation can also be done with discrete time dynamics, except that it becomes a lot more complicated, of course. And discrete time, time dynamics is very close to assuming that there is a certain delay before you can react. You have a situation, you react to it, and so, so this. Yeah, but with, with uh, discrete dynamics, you react to some state, to the next state. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, of you reacting to two steps back. Mm -hmm. I think there, there must be uh, results because there are definitely, there is a lot of work, for instance, in lotka volterra equations with delay, where one can find very interesting bifurcation phenomena and so on. And every result on lotka volterra translates into replicator dynamics. I, right now, uh, I cannot think of any bona fide game theoretical uh, paper where such delays are studied. Uh, Josef, uh, Shakespeare, he knows a lot more about the literature, but uh, shakes his head. Uh, apparently, he cannot think of any ism. No, I just had a question about this Chatley triangle case. Uh, I see the determinant mm -hmm. uh, varying there. Is there any hope for a hot bifurcation there, or, or am I just? Uh... Well, yes, this is a, this is a, a yeah. hot bifurcation. I yes. You can make the determinant depend on, on a single parameter, and, and you get then this uh, funny Hopf bifurcation, where, the, uh, where you come to a, to a triangular limit cycle. But it's an interesting thing, both in this best reply dynamics and in the imitates a better dynamics, is that the vector field is not continuous. There are lines where it can suddenly switch. And uh, this creates technical question, usually not very, uh, usually they can be solved, but uh, they can be uh, disagreeable. Yeah. Okay, maybe we close now and wait for our next lecture. Thank next, you. Uh, Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. No, I think I, I was this time too, too fast. Very provocative. Mm -hmm. Thank you.